Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, it's one of those titles where I just immediately clicked on and uh, set up OBS Studio and press record. Let's go. Churchill Eisenhower 1944 shoot off. Mark Felton Productions, original link to the video, top of the description. Preemptive like. My name's Connor if you're new. Hope everyone's doing well. Let's go. On the 24th of March 1944, three of World War II's most important Allied leaders had a shootout in a corner of England. Who won has never been revealed, but what was more revealing was that one of the shooters' passion for firearms, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. In the lead up to the Second Front, the Allied Looks like a Chicago mob boss. An invasion of Normandy, the political and military top brass of Britain and America frequently visited units that would storm the beaches on D-Day or drop from the skies over occupied France. It was important that ordinary troops saw their leaders in the flesh, and for the leaders to gauge the preparedness of the units they would be sending on the very risky gamble of a full-scale amphibious invasion of Hitler's fortress Europe. The 24th of March, 19... I would love, a, like, a... I was about to say life-sized map, but that would be, like, as big as the... <laughs> well, life-sized map... A life-sized map would just be real life. Sorry, a, a large map like this would be really of cool. Hitler's Fortress Europe. The 24th of March 1944 visit was to two U.S. units, the 2nd Armor Division and the 9th Infantry Division that were co-located on a huge training base at Tidworth in Wiltshire, England. Accompanying Prime Minister Churchill was Allied Supreme Commander General Dwight D. Eisenhower and U.S. First Army Commander Future General President. Omar Bradley. After witnessing some field maneuvers and the like, the three leaders were invited over to some trestle tables where a collection of weapons had been placed for their inspection, standard small arms issued to both divisions. Churchill loved this sort of thing, having been a combat officer in several Imperial campaigns when he was young, including riding in the charge at Omdurman in the Sudan in 1898, personally dispatching several of Queen Victoria's enemies with his Mauser C-96 broom handle pistol. Churchill, in temporary political disgrace following the failed Dardanelles campaign in World War I, had then served as a battalion commander in the trenches, wielding there a U.S. Colt 1911 as his personal weapon of choice. And the so in the Dardanelles in World War One, that that's when uh, there was a lot of mining. I'm not really saying like to teach anyone. I'm I'm kind of like half asking, um, if I'm correct here. But uh, Dardanelles campaign World War. I, that's when there were a lot of mines in the Dardanelles, the Strait that like is in between the Aegean Sea and the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, and enormous losses at first for British ships moving in there through from mines and, and whatnot. There might have been cannon fire too, but I believe the where Churchill was upset was that he believed that all of the damage that could have been done was done, and so why not push through? You know, you, you suffered all of the damage you could. Obviously, this is a bit in hindsight, and, and so is he, kind of. Uh, and so th that's what it was, right? Building there a U.S. Colt had then served as a battalion commander in the trenches, wielding there a U.S. Colt 1911 as his personal weapon of choice. And the doughty Prime Minister was soon photographed on the 24th of March 1944, wielding his signature weapon, Thompson? the U.S. Thompson submachine gun, emptying a couple of magazines downrange. Famously, Churchill had been photographed wielding a Thompson in July 1940 on a visit to coastal defences west of Hartlepool, and one of the images of the pinstripe-suited Prime Minister holding a drum magazine Thompson became legendary. Churchill knew the power of the image. When he said in his famous speech that we will fight them on the beaches, he looked like he would have joined him with the troops personally if the Germans had the temerity and the foolishness to attempt a landing in England. Churchill was very interested in new weapons and often was photographed firing them. 
In June That's the 1941, tube, right? he test fired oh, the pipe tube. The new Sten Mark II submachine gun at Shoebriness in Essex. And in November 19... Isn't that what it was nicknamed? 1942, the updated Lee Enfield No. 4 rifle. Someone else who was a Thompson fan was King George VI. During the dark days of 1940, when Britain appeared to be faced with a potential German invasion, the King ordered an outdoor shooting range constructed in the garden of Buckingham Palace. And on this photograph, I mark roughly where the backstop of this range once was. The range was used by both himself, his family, and his aides to practice with various weapons, including his Thompson and service pistols. His wife, Queen Elizabeth, later known as the Queen Mother, insisted on- Which weapon was this, guys? The BAR? Is, I only know a few, I think, from, mainly from Call of Duty, Thompson Bar, M1 Grand. His wife, Queen Elizabeth, later known as the Queen Mother, insisted on receiving pistol training as well, and also practiced on the range. At Tidworth on the 24th of March 1944, Winston Churchill perused the tables of weapons with Generals Eisenhower and Bradley. There was the familiar Colt M1911, an M1917 45 revolver, a Springfield 1903 A4 sniper rifle that Churchill examined closely, an M1 Garand rifle, and two versions of the Thompson the M1A1 and the earlier M1928A1. But there was one weapon that particularly caught Churchill's eye. The M1 carbine had entered US service in 1942. It was a lightweight, semi-automatic weapon chambered in .30 carbine, and at this stage of the war used a 15-round detachable box magazine. Many Allied leaders were enamored of the U.S. carbine, and the King himself was presented with one which he shot frequently. Another celebrity owner, surprisingly, was Field Marshal Sir Bernard Montgomery, who was intensely patriotic, yet chose an M1 carbine as his personal protection weapon, mounted on brackets on a bar behind the front seats of his Humber staff car, Monty keeping this weapon in his vehicle during the entire Northwest Europe campaign. At Tidworth, during the Prime Minister's visit, security was tight, though Churchill only had a single bodyguard at his side all of the time. Police Inspector W. H. Thompson, who was, from 1943 onwards, armed not with a British pistol, but with a German Luger, following an accidental discharge incident when his issue 38 Webley and Scott revolver fell out of his jacket, wounding him. Churchill himself had approved the use of a Luger, one of several held by the Metropolitan Police that had been confiscated from civilians at the beginning of the war. It almost looks like what I would assume like a water gun that, that it, like you would have as a kid. Obviously, it would be plastic and some see-through see colored plastic. But that, that's what I think of when I see it. it it's an interesting weapon as someone who knows very little about weapons, but it it almost looks, it looks almost like a toy to me. That day, quite the shooting match was hastily organized after Churchill suggested a shoot-off between himself, Eisenhower, and Bradley using the M1 carbine. Targets were promptly put out, Bradley's at 75 yards, Ike's at 50 yards, and Churchill's, the oldest of the three, at 25 yards. Each man had an M1 and one full magazine of 15 rounds. Standing in a line, the three shooters fired 15 rounds each at their targets. If any wagers were made, they would not be called in, for the commander of the 9th Infantry Division, Major General Manton S. Eddy, diplomatically hustled the big three away to another part of the visit, before anyone could find out who had the highest score, which was probably a good idea in the interests of Anglo-American relations. It, it sounds... I get it. I, I get it. The winner of the carbine match remains a mystery to this day, but I'd have put my money on Churchill, as he probably had the most experience and was also a keen hunter, both big game and birds as well. Thanks for watching. I feel like if, if Eisenhower, like one of the American, like if Eisenhower won, I feel like maybe it would have been leaked later. And the fact that it never was leaked makes me feel like Churchill might have won. But again, what do I know? But 
it does look like Eisenhower has a more confident stance. Means nothing coming from me, but uh, the winner of the yeah, I, I understand. At first, you know, thought it might be like, oh, who cares? Just you know, who won? But I I do get it. The more I think about it, why put any tension whatsoever and maybe have soldiers down ranks kind of poke fun at each other for uh, if once they found out who won and then that could just snowball into what was initially just a fun competition to why have the trouble, you know? So I understand ushering them away before finding out who won. Um, it would be cool to know after the war ended. Um, well, again, they, they ushered them off. I'm, I'm not sure if maybe some of the hiccups, sorry. Somebody else might have gone down range to check or something. I don't know. Hiccups. <clears throat> Love you all. Hope you're all doing well. Would appreciate any comments down below. Uh, anything I said that was just wrong would appreciate it. Was I right on the Dardanelles World War One thing? I don't know. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.